Good Tuesday afternoon, guys. My name is Jerry Miller. Welcome to the I Love Seaville show. Thank you kindly for joining us on a glorious, 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 glorious day to be alive. Live, of course, in Charlottesville, Albemarle County, the Commonwealth, the country, and the world on the I Love Seaville network. The good doctor of Scott Wagner Integrated Medicine, thank you for being a part of this show. Dr. Wagner and his team absolutely have your back. The fine folks at Ting Fiber Internet powering the network. Ting Fiber Internet. Crazy fast internet. Trey Murphy the third hires an agent. Trey Murphy the third hasta luego from Charlottesville. Trey Murphy the third one year and done in Seaville and in a UVA uniform. Trey Murphy the third I think is going to make an even better pro than he did a college player. His upside pretty darn good I think. In fact, I'll make a comparison and, and I've alluded to this in the past. I'll make a comparison with Trey Murphy the third and. Um, DeAndre Hunter. Um, so we'll, we'll tell you why we think Trey Murphy III could be not just a good pro, but potentially a perennial all-star. We'll talk about the open container situation, which we've, we've led the charge on here with the Isle of Seville Network. Yesterday, the Office of Economic Development presented the concept to Charlottesville City Council. We will relay that to you. Mayor Nakia Walker, as predicted, offering the most resistance to the open container outdoor beer garden concept. We'll tell you why we think Mayor Nakia Walker is offering that resistance and where we go from here. We'll catch up with Market Action with Alex Erpe, CEO of Emergent Financial Services. We'll talk the, the markets and what's, um, what's transpiring. Bitcoin dropped below 30K briefly today. Um, Airlines are getting a little sniff on what uh, the future holds or, or the, the normalcy that was before COVID coming back as business travel slowly, slowly, slowly comes back and retailers rank up $5.6 billion with a B in sales during the first 24 hours of Prime Day. A lot to cover on today's show. Um, UVA Baseball. In action today on, at, at 7 o'clock against Mississippi State, UVA hoops, the boys, excuse me, UVA baseball, the boys of summer, Mississippi State, in a, in a game that they very well could win. You look at their record, and they have the worst record of active teams in the College World Series, but they are legitimately the team you just do not want to face. We'll take a look at the 7 o'clock matchup against Mississippi State. That checks in at 46 and 16. The University of Virginia, 36 and 25 overall. I think the lead of the show, however, has got to be the presentation from the Office of Economic Development in regards to the open container idea that we've been trying to push for about two years now. You know, the wheels of local government move extremely slow. That's called bureaucracy and red tape. It's the antithesis of what we do here at these businesses, which is 1,000 miles an hour with the expectation of getting you-know-what done by close of business every day. That's how we grow. That's how we stay alive. That's how we feed our families. Two years plus, we've been percolating the idea of an open container concept in the downtown mall. That concept now is at the goal line. And we need like a Marshawn Litch, a John Riggins, a Camara to take the ball over the goal line and into the end zone to really showcase the potential of the concept. As predicted, Mayor Nakia Walker offered the resistance to the open container idea on the downtown mall. Mayor Nakia Walker, her lens, how she views the city, governance, policy, is through that of a social justice and or an activist lens. How I view the city, how I view the county, how I view policy, how I view leadership, if I'm fortunate to get elected for Board of Supervisors, is through the lens of a small, medium-sized business owner that is searching and sourcing incremental tax revenue ideas to take the burden off the populace. You, us, 
all of us, taxpayers. Incremental sources of revenue means we may not potentially be taxed as hard. More on that later. I am working on this thing we call EQ, emotional intelligence, empathy, feelings. <laughs> I've especially worked on it since my boy was born, three years into working on this EQ. I think my uh, wonderful better half would say, uh, you're slowly turning from a stone, a rock, with your empathy and your EQ, to one that embraces vulnerability and does not run away from emotions and what you're feeling. Less compartmentalizing, more actualizing of said emotions. So I lead with that by trying to embody an empathetic mindset when considering the policy and the plight of the most influ influential elected official in the city, which is the mayor. And her position is the following. Downtown and its patrons have some things in common. And the things that downtown and the patrons on the mall have in common are some of the following. The large majority of the folks that are shopping and buying and spending and eating and drinking and listening to music on the eight blocks that are the heartbeat of the city are white. They're white. It's something that is indisputable. On any given day, you walk from the Ting Pavilion to the Code Building, you see this. In fact, in a recent survey conducted a handful of years ago, a little over 70% of the patrons on the downtown mall were of white skin tone. So the mayor, who looks at policy, governance, and the city through the lens of social justice, through the lens of activism, in her mind, she says, how can an outdoor beer garden, it's a beer garden, you can call it an open container, whatever the hell you want to call it, it's an outdoor beer garden. How can this concept create more Diversity, more inclusion on the downtown mall. And as I'm becoming more empathetic in considering other perspectives that are different than mine, I'm reflecting on what she is saying. And from her position, which I respect, having an outdoor beer garden likely will not create more diversity in the heartbeat of the city. She's right in that regard. You heard me say that, Mayor Walker. You're right in that regard. Now we have to weigh almost like the scales of justice. And in weighing the scales of justice, undoubtedly inclusion and diversity in the city should be prioritized, should be considered paramount. As affordability in this municipality becomes a tremendous issue from a housing standpoint, there's no question the population in the city is getting whiter and whiter and whiter and more affluent than ever before. I've called it a bastion or a white playground. It's hard to argue against this. Frankly speaking, with out-of-market employers bringing out-of-market talent, Dexcom, CoStar, with out-of-market employers like Dexcom and CoStar coming to this market, that problem is going to accelerate. Take it a step further. Joffrey Woodruff, the hedge fund titan, founder of QIM, across the street from our building here on Market Street. He's close to opening up Code, Center of Developing Entrepreneurs in the former Ice Park. Code is going to be a portfolio of his businesses. He allocated $125 million to the University of Virginia for a school of data science. 
125 million out of his pocket, he's expecting return on investment. His ROI for allocating 125 million to the University of Virginia to create a new school for data science is he has a farm system or a pipeline of talent to his portfolio of companies, to his portfolio of businesses, to his master plan, his comprehensive plan. Think about it like this. The Atlanta Braves, my favorite baseball team. They got a farm system. They got a team in Macon. They got the AAA team in Richmond. I remember as a kid, my dad's a diehard sports fan. I'm a diehard sports fan, and mom was a really good sport, and she became a diehard sports fan. I remember mom and dad taking little bro and I to, to Richmond to see the Richmond Braves play. And on this particular Richmond Braves baseball team, Chipper Jones was on the roster. Ryan Klesko was on the roster. Javi Lopez, the catcher, was on the roster. Just a team of filthy, filthy talent. The Richmond Braves were up big. The manager of the Richmond Braves decides to take out his studs. Larry Chipper Jones, Ryan Klesko, Javi Lopez come to mind. I'm sitting over there. I must be... You know, single digits, eight, nine, ten years old, roughly. And I'm watching, we had good seats behind home plate as Ryan Klesko was trading three or four signed baseballs. Ryan Klesko was the first baseman. He had the mutton chops for sideburns. He's a bigger guy, thick guy, but dude, he could turn on a fastball and he could go yard and he hit for average for a good period of time in the, in the, in the big leagues. So I'm watching over there at eight, nine, ten year old, and I'm like, that's Ryan Klesko, Jeffrey. Jeffrey's my brother. I'm like, that's Ryan Klesko. Look at what Ryan's doing. And Ryan's autographing baseballs. And he takes three or four autographed baseballs. And he hands them over the dugout. And in return, he gets two big pints of beer. And he brings these two big pints of beer into the dugout obviously for him to have a couple beverages because the, the Richmond Braves were up big and he, the, the stars were pulled and he's enjoying probably a, a Bud Light or Coors Light while sitting on the pine in the dugout. So Richmond was the farm system for the Atlanta Braves. The boys, Chipper, Ryan, Javi, got a taste of play in Richmond. They showed pop, proof of performance, and then Bobby Cox and John Shoreholtz call up Chipper, and Javi, and Ryan to the Atlanta Braves. And over a decade plus, Chipper and Javi and Ryan team with John Smoltz and Tommy Glavin and Greg Maddox to create a dynasty, a dynasty of proportions that influenced my life. I would sprint home when I was not playing sports in high school, which was rare because I played a lot of sports in high school, and I would turn on TBS, and then TBS 435, TBS five minutes behind. Remember TBS? It, all the programming started at 335, 305, 505, 435, five minutes behind. I'm sprinting home to catch the Braves play at 435. My brother was a Cubs fan. He was a Cubs fan because of WGN. WGN aired all the Cubs games. I was a Braves fan because of TBS. So this pipeline, this farm system made the Braves a dynasty. A dynasty that many kids, many men, now, now men, formerly kids, fell in love with because they were winning and constantly on television because of Turner Broadcasting System, TBS. Same situation with Mr. Joffrey Woodruff. Mr. Joffrey Woodruff, his financial resources, probably the most in this community. Maybe second most. I'd be curious to see how he compares with Ted. Is it Ted Weschler? Ted Weschler is Warren Buffett's right-hand man. And I might be mispronouncing his last name. His first name is Ted. Ted Weschler, I believe his name. When I sold Charlottesville Restaurant Week, when I sold Charlottesville Restaurant Week to the Hook and the Sevo Weekly ownership team, the deal had to be authorized in part by Ted Weschler. So I'm doing this deal, five-figure deal, and, and I'm like, this is so cool. Warren Buffett's right-hand person is authorizing a, a deal I'm a part of. Bill Chapman was there. 
Blair Kelly was there. They were negotiating with me in person. But the authorization had to go through Mr. Weschler. I hope I'm not butchering your last name, sir. I thought it was so cool. So Joffrey, either he or Ted or Tops from a, a wealth standpoint in this area. Interestingly, in side note, I digress, I know, but that's part of uh, the positive and cons of ADD. Um, interestingly, Ted was able to earn a spot as Warren Buffett's top lieutenant through a charity um, auction. And Ted, he won the hour lunch with Warren Buffett, the Oracle of Omaha, by spending millions of dollars. You could look it up online. I don't know the exact number, but I'm talking millions of dollars for an hour of Warren Buffett's time at lunch. He did it in back-to-back -back years through the same charity auction. First year, millions of dollars. Second year, a little bit more millions more. That time with the Oracle of Omaha impressed the Oracle of Omaha Warren Buffett so much that Tend was brought on the Oracle of Omaha's team as his lead lieutenant. And now as the Oracle of Omaha trots into the sunset, you spend some time watching CNBC, he comes on occasionally. You see that the wheels aren't spitting, and I'm not marginalizing this man. This man is investing in financial genius. But you see on CNBC, the wheels just aren't spinning at the same rate they once did. I'm not marginalizing the guy. Please do not think I'm marginalizing Warren Buffett. There's just, I mean, he's 80 plus. How old is Warren Buffett? I'm going to do a quick Google search to get his exact age. Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett is, so I was right. Warren Buffett is um, 90 years old. Turns 91 on August 30th. 91. And the man is still investing and building wealth. Through Berkshire Hathaway. 91 on August 30th, the Oracle of Omaha. You watch them on CNBC, the wheels aren't spitting at the clip they once spun. Ted, who's got ties to Charlottesville, believes still has a home in Charlottesville, is going to take over as the primary investor for this man's firm. So I'll get back to the point. Joffrey has got QIM. Through this data analytics firm that he's built, he's accrued and established wealth that anyone watching this show likely will never, ever, ever, ever come close to experiencing. Frankly, we can aggregate everyone that's watching this show, and the aggregation of all the wealth is not going to even sniff, not even sniff what Joffrey's got. This dude's given $12 million to the Boar's Head for a squash facility. This dude's given $125 million to the University of Virginia for a data science school. This data science school is going to be his Richmond Braves. And this data science school is going to have a bunch of Ryan Kleskos and Chipper Jones and Javi Lopez. And just like Chipper Jones is a Hall of Famer, and just like Ryan Klesko was a couple, three, four-year all-star, and Javi Lopez was a one, two-year all-star and a very serviceable catcher. You have degrees of talent in that farm system. The $125 million a year data science school is going to have similar degrees of talent. You're going to have your chippers, your Ryans, and your Javis. The chippers, Joffrey Woodruff hopes, will be funneled directly to code into one of the businesses, the many he has invested in, and he's going to be like, your talent's best suited for this. Your talent's best suited for this. Your talent's best suited for this. And as the center of developing entrepreneurs comes to market, as Dexcom comes to market, as CoStar comes to market, as the cost of the housing stock in our community continues to rise, as interest rates stay low, as new construction is minimal, next to little, coming to market, and as we're in a landlocked 10.2 square mile city with little area to continue housing development, you have a problem that's getting exponentially, exponentially, and exponentially more magnified. And that's white, rich, playground, Charlottesville. 
So the mayor, the Kyle Walker, through the lens of activism and social justice, is asking, how does this beer garden concept create quality? Diversity. How does it create eclectic thought in the heartbeat of the town? And I am empathetic for that thought process. The older I've gotten, the more empathetic I've become. Still have a long ways to go. Long ways to go. Now it's up to us, leaders in the community, influencers of the community, whatever the hell you want to call it, to weigh the scales of justice. And here we have the scales of justice. On one side, you have a downtown mall that's 20% vacancy rate. Restaurant tours that have accrued a hell of a lot of debt because of COVID and the fact that they couldn't operate their business like they normally would. Restaurant tours that can't find staffing because their staff has now found other careers because of COVID because they were unable to work. You got loans that need to be paid back. Some of them taken second mortgages or HELOCs, home equity lines of credit against their homes that are coming due. The debt service alone is enough to create the loss of hair and exponential aging and sleepless nights. That's on one side of the scales of justice. On the other side of the scale of justice, you have diversity, inclusion, equality, eclectic thought. And you got to weigh them as a leader. And you got to ask yourself, how can I get the best situation? There's never a perfect answer. And I've found perfection is the enemy of productivity. So if you're searching for perfection, you're just going to spin your wheels and you're going to get in action. Entrepreneurs, small and medium-sized business owners, realize this quickly. Perfection is a dangerous word. The word better utilized is production. Not perfection, but production. So as you're weighing the scales of justice, you have to think production and moving the needle forward. The open air beer garden, yes, is likely not going to create diversity. The open air beer garden, yes, is likely going to create more, I'll cut to the chase, white affluence in the heartbeat of Charlottesville. But if you're thinking from a macro perspective, and I would encourage anyone that is watching this show, please write this down. E-Myth Mastery. It's a book that really changed how I go about running my businesses. E-Myth Mastery is written by Michael Gerber. You can get this book anywhere. I've read this book 10 times. The concept of E-Myth Mastery is working on your business instead of in your business. Often when you're rolling up your sleeves and working in your business, you can't see the forest through the trees. You don't see the aerial or macro picture because you're so stuck on the day-to-day -day grind that you don't have the bird's eye view or the vision to determine where you should go. When I read E-Myth Mastery, I started realizing, heck, this is the wrong way of running the shop. I got to work on it instead of in it. So from an empathetic position, I would encourage the mayor and I would encourage Councillor Michael Payne, each who showed some resistance to this idea yesterday, to think on, work on local government instead of in local government. Yes, the beer garden likely will not create diversity, but the incremental revenue that is source created and established, incremental sources of tax revenue that are reoccurring month to month, day to day, week to week, quarter to quarter, year to year. Freaking annuity 
It's an annuity. The incremental revenue, month to month, day to day, week to week, quarter to quarter, year to year, that incremental revenue can be allocated for diversity programs to get what you really stand for, which in the mayor's case is social justice and activism. What better way than to take that incremental revenue, new revenue, that's incremental. Incremental is new revenue. Two kinds of revenue for a business. Revenue that's already on the books and incremental revenue. Both revenues are extremely important. You want to keep your revenue on the books by servicing the clients and your customers well so they continue spending with you. That's established current revenue. But you also want to focus on finding new clients, new customers, and new business to work alongside that's incremental. And if you can get enough incremental revenue while not losing your established revenue, then your business grows. And as your business grows, you're able to do different things with the growth. So I would encourage the mayor, and please someone send her this clip. Someone tag her and let her know that I'm talking from an empathetic, respectful, and golden rule position. Same to you, Michael Payne. Empathetic, respectful, and golden rule position, Councillor Payne. The incremental revenue that comes from this concept can be allocated to creative ideas. Give teachers raises. How about that? Our teachers deserve to live in our community, don't you think? I certainly do. Our teachers shouldn't be driving from Waynesboro or 50 minutes away because that, that's all they can afford. Give some teachers a bump in pay. Okay? Give the teachers more revenue. Give the teachers more money. Give the teachers more bonus. Give them an, uh, uh, an increase in pay that's ahead of the cost of inflation. How about our police fire and rescue? Why do our police fire and rescue? Why can they not afford to live in this area? Give the police fire and rescue more money. Why don't we take the incremental revenue that comes from this concept and, and create this idea? Are you ready? These are the type of concepts that I will bring to the Board of Supervisors if you guys elect me. Incremental sourced revenue can be used to create a computer coding program. Something that is potentially similar to Joffrey Woodruff's data science school. So for the students in our community that do not come from resources or means, when someone says resources or means, that they mean money. For the students in our community that don't come from money, there's a data science school that's provided by the city or the county. Instead of tied to $30,000 a year tuition at the University of Virginia, room and board, books, etc., Maybe there's ones for students that don't have resources and means. That's for computer coding, data science, application development on smartphones. My friends, this isn't the future, it's today. Data science, coding, app development. That's, to, that's yesterday. It's not the future, it's yesterday. How amazing would it be for Albemarle County and the city of Charlottesville to create a joint venture on an app development, computer coding, data science program for young men and young women that don't have financial resources and can't get that, no that knowledge anywhere else besides college at 25, 30K a year. You can utilize economic prior prioritization and I prioritize small and medium-sized business owners because they are the backbone of the community. They create the jobs, they generate the revenue, and they keep the revenue of the community. You can leverage the small and medium-sized business support to create social justice and activist endeavors. Endeavors that breed equality, inclusion, and eclectic thought. Endeavors that breed people of color on the downtown mall. For so long I've said, this feels like common sense to me. But I realize it's not.
And that's why I want to get involved civically at the local level in a thankless job that's going to require 40 hours of work a week for $16,000 a year in pay. And that's what being an elected official is. 40 hours of work a week for 16 k a year in pay in Almaro County. And then you compound that 11 cents an hour when you break it down. It's like 11 cents an hour. You compound that 11 cents an hour by realizing your policy, your decision making is going to polarize half the community and it's going to take the other half of the community and make them lukewarm about your policy. It's thankless. It is thankless. But you do it for the betterment of your town or your county that's been really good to you. You do it because you feel compelled constantly. to give back. Because if you don't, you feel a sense of guilt associated with the exploitation of God-given abilities for strictly capitalistic purposes. And I don't want that guilt And that's a very honest look into what I feel on an everyday basis. That guilt. I understand the gift of communication, vision, the ability to manage risk, and how to make a buck. And utilizing that for strictly personal gain is not what I want to do all the time. And I'm fortunate that we're at a position where we don't have to do that all the time. And frankly, I'm even most fortunate that I have an incredible wife that will, after some, and by some I mean a hell of a lot, persuading and is giving me the green light to do it. So I ask respectfully empathetically and kindly for Councillor Michael Payne and Mayor Nakaya Walker to realize the e-myth mastery of local government. Work on the city instead of in the city and realize when you're managing the scales of justice, that prioritizing economic growth and activity does not mean you are sidetracking, deprioritizing, or ignoring social justice, activism, inclusion, diversity, and eclectic thought. Please. All right, I'm going to reach out to our friend Alex Erpe. I love this guy. Um, Alex, why don't we try this on the fly? We've had a little, um, I'm going to try Skype first, Judah. We'll see if we can connect it via Skype. If not, then we're going to go to the phone call, and we'll get him on conference call via phone. So we're trying this on the fly. This is literally live programming on the fly here. Um, Oh, we, we're going to do the call. I don't know what it is. Um, I'll try the call. Okay. It's, it's likely us. It's likely us. I'll call you back. I'll call you back on this. Um, all right. We're going to get Alex on the uh, conference call. Um, J-Dubs, how do you want me to do this? Can I get him on speaker here? I'll try to keep same voice. I'm going to get same voices that's coming in via speaker, okay? Hey, Jerry.
Hey, what's up, Alex? You get that photo on screen? Alex, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, fantastic. So we're going to do this. Uh, this is called um, Do What You Gotta Do, Do I Good. Do what you gotta do to make it work. That's right, my friend. How are you? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing fantastic, my friend. Um, my friend, where do you want to start here in regards to... I'm follow, yep, I'm following your lead here. Where do you want to start, Alex, in regards to the market? Um, and before Congress, he's got a couple questions uh, that they're going to ask him. I expect it to focus a lot on just what he thinks of inflation. And he's going to repeat. It's always amazing with the Federal Reserve that sometimes we, we get there, we get like a cheat sheet of what he's going to say before he even says it, which is always uh, fascinating. But basically, he's going to repeat that the Federal Reserve is looking at uh, inflation as being transitory. Definitely, you know, people getting back into the swing of things. Uh, the market seems to be taking it so far calmly. Um, Bitcoin, very interesting that it has um, declined. It tipped, it dipped slightly below thirty thousand for a, a quick set there. Um, it now has. Uh, it looks like it's recovering a little, but just goes to show the the swings of Bitcoin. I think are very interesting as they go to show just how much it's reliant on what governments are saying because when the every time china seems to indicate that they may consider banning it uh it, it dips slightly so it goes to show i think it's really instructive for people to see where the value of bitcoin is coming from and that's basically who else out there intends to use it or buy it let me throw this to you what country in this world has a the greatest impact on the markets uh in the united states Definitely still, I would say, the United States. Well, besides the U.S., outside besides the U.S. Besides the U.S., okay. D -d 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 besides the U.S., I'm going to be honest, it probably is, besides the U.S., I would indeed say China is the biggest impact on the United States. Just what, what they do has a huge, I mean, not even just from a socio geopolitical perspective in terms of things like coronavirus and so forth, just even from a purely economic perspective, um, their purchasing power has become vast. We know their productive power is vast. Their decisions in terms of um, just their currency have major impacts uh, on the United States. And, of course, what so many U.S. firms, it's, it's, you have to keep in mind that a lot of United States companies are at this point, you'd, better, you'd be better off describing them as global companies than as United States companies. And huge parts of their revenue streams are either reliant on China or they want to be. In other words, if they're not currently selling to China, which is the biggest, soon to be the biggest consumer market in the world, they are intending to sell to China. And so that's a major impact because China doesn't, it's not like the U.S. where, you know, if you want to sell goods to U.S. consumers, you, you set up shop, you go through some of the red tape, and you start selling your your widgets or your services. In China, the, the everything is connected. So the Chinese government often asks for something in exchange. And for tech companies, it's often some of their tech. Maybe you have to use it. I mean, Google basically runs a censorship program for the Chinese out there that if you search certain things on Google, they won't show up if the Chinese government doesn't want them. So China asks for things in exchange for access to that market, and that can have major impact on U.S. companies. So definitely, they, you have to keep an eye on that just and recognize that a lot of things, a lot of stocks in the S&P 500 that appear to be U.S. companies have to do your research and realize that they're, they're global companies, and where are they getting their revenues from? So I'm going to give you a hypothetical Let's say China. Let's say China no longer re uh, recognizes Bitcoin as a currency. What's your prediction? Oh, well, Bitcoin declines rapidly in that in that case because China is going to be the first. Right? If China China says I, we're not recognizing Bitcoin as a currency and and goes further, I would say goes further to the state of banning them because at this point, a lot of governments, even the United States government, you can't use Bitcoin to pay your taxes, for example. So it's not recognized in the way that the dollar is recognized. But if China takes the first step um, and says as a major 
as a major country and there is a major economy on the world stage and says Bitcoin is illegal and we do it, we're pushing it to the underground and you cannot use it as legal tender then that that's basically sets the stage for a lot of other countries that take their cues from China uh, to do the same and there really is you can see the incentive there because there really is not much incentive for the the governments of the world to permit that kind of alternative currency especially if they themselves intend to go digital at some point so okay next question for you and you're educating everybody why would china ban bitcoin knowing the influence that ban will have on the bitcoin markets is it solely to flex its muscles and maintain control over its its people why would they do that the, 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 i think there's a, a couple reasons it's it's hard to, to figure out I'll, I'll stick to the economic ones i mean there's always geopolitical reasons with china so they may be like you said they may be flexing their muscle uh they may be sending a message um but I'll, even just from a purely economic perspective it seems to me the number one reason that we that we tend to look at, at least in emerging financial services we look at the fact that china is interested very interested in a digital renminbi so renminbi is the official word for the yuan basically the chinese currency and china just like india is looking very seriously at taking the renminbi digital in which case you're talking basically it'll be like it'll it'll be like a bitcoin you buy and you buy and sell things with it without ever actually touching any kind of physical currency and it only exists in the digital space thereby allowing china to really have even more control over their currency because if you think about it, india is already um attempting experimenting with this which is in india they recently basically gave people 1000 rupees of digital digital rupees straight into their bank accounts that had an expiration date So if you didn't spend this thousand rupees in six months, and it, it vanished from your bank account, and you can immediately see the usefulness of that from a a stimulus perspective, because China can base any time China needs to uh, enact a stimulus package, while well, they give everyone a thousand renminbi and say you have to spend this in three months, boost our economy, and they can't risk a competing currency there. And, and it's particularly not a competing digital cryptocurrency that they cannot control the supply of. And so the moment they go digital with a digital renminbi, China is not going to want some sort of digital competition either in underground markets or as something that an average person will consider purchasing or using to buy and sell goods. They are going to want everyone to be on their platform, their digital platform. And that's i think really the the impetus for this because the talk of china banning um bitcoin basically started soon after there began to be the rumors in the economic sphere that china is seriously looking at digitizing their currency all right so that was an excellent explanation um alex erpi is the ceo of emergent financial services we're talking bitcoin with alex erpi ceo of emergent financial services what would it what will it take for emergent financial services to suggest buying bitcoin again mm, that's a very good question it just for for us it always depends one of one of the things we tend to prioritize as emergent is that each person is very unique so for us it will depend entirely on the circumstances of the person i i would venture to say for for the average investor um that we're taught that we're dealing with the average clients that we deal with on a daily basis at emergent that they're you know they're looking to save for their retirement really looking in long term bitcoin is really not going to come into play because it's it it doesn't serve um a purpose of diversification in the portfolio that that warrants adding it to the portfolio so if you think about any kind of portfolio you have with diversification the reason you're adding something new diversifying is because you want it to move in a different you want to be sure that if one of your if US stocks move in a certain direction and they increase you want something in your portfolio that doesn't move in the same direction so you you don't want all your investments to decline at the same time right and so but you have to weigh that diversification against the risk and for us for most individual investors i would say the risk of adding something like bitcoin which is very volatile very speculative 
does it, it does it isn't offset by any diversification, but as you can add other you can add other asset classes to someone's portfolio to protect them that don't involve going into Bitcoin. I would say from a from a the perspective of an individual investor who maybe has some money on the side, in other words, he, you have your retirement fund, you you really set, you have it with a, a financial advisor you trust, and now you've got another two thousand, five thousand, ten thousand dollars that you you want to see. Well, can I make something short term with this? I'm willing to lose it, but maybe if I hit on a couple big investments, it'll pay for a nice vacation, something along that nature. Well, then. I, for us, I think the key is always take a look at where it's been, right? Take a look at, and for us, it's always don't look at the recent news, right? Because that's factored into the price of Bitcoin. By the time you go and read, for the average investor, by the time we go on CNBC or on Fox Business and we're reading about China making a Bitcoin announcement, price of Bitcoin has already changed. There are people who had that news Big investors had the news well before we did, and they've that's reflected in the price. So you always have to be thinking as the investor. Our advice is always you got to be thinking expectations. What do I think could happen? What are the rationales for the big actors out there? China, India, United States, other Western countries, economies. What are what are their rationale? What are moves they might make? What are moves major companies might make in respect to cryptocurrency? And that has to be the basis of your decision making on when to buy. You can't be looking at today's news because by the time you're seeing today's news, the, the price is already reflecting that. Alex Erpy, guys, our guest um, via phone, CEO of Emergent Financial Services. Alex Erpy, CEO of Emergent Financial Services. A macro question for you here, Alex. Go uh, for it. And I learn from you often. So we have... For the fourth straight month, existing home sales dropped in May. Mm -hmm. That's four straight months, existing home sales have dropped in May. Affordability is obviously an issue. We have the Federal Reserve that essentially is continuing to backstop this economy. We got interest rates at obscenely low maybe upticking a little bit from six months ago, but still obscenely low from a generational, multi-generational standpoint. We got from an employment standpoint, we're still not at the same employment levels we were before COVID. I think that may be a reflection of some of those jobs being cannibalized by more efficient digital, uh, digital, uh, digital efficiencies, let's call it that. Mm -hmm. We got the markets doing pretty darn well today, and the market's doing pretty darn well. I mean, the S&P 500 is inching closer to a record. NASDAQ is at an all-time high. Oh, yes. I mean, let's face it, the markets have done well since COVID. The markets have crushed it. The divide between Main Street and Wall Street has never been greater than right now. Your macro take on the U.S. economy. So... Uh, what I would say on the U.S. economy is the macro tape. So when you're looking at the home sales in particular, right, what we're seeing is the, the home sales are now getting back to pre-pandemic levels, so which tells you how much that we've had four straight months of declines. That tells you how much home sales skyrocketed at the late stages of pandemic. So we're now looking pre-pandemic levels, but with prices much higher. And that's a key, that's a key thing to consider, right? We're talking, I think, unemployment that is, let's face it, it's, it's lagging where we would like to see in terms of people willing to go back to work. Um, and so I think what we're seeing with the economy is demand is, is improving. People are willing to go out and buy again. But we're seeing, I think what we're seeing is supply is our big question here. It's supply in Real estate. It's, I mean, part of the existing home sales falling is because um, housing inventory is now beginning to. We're seeing questionable situations here in terms of the pricing, right? And so, what we're seeing is the supply is our big question here: supply of goods, supply of services, supply of labor. I mean, it's, it, it. We often think of. I know it's very important to keep in mind that you know people who go to work, we're, we're people. We're not goods or services were not things you buy but we are on the supply side you and i don't work every day is the supply side of the economy not the demand side and so 
between all those things, what I'm seeing with the economy, what we're seeing is demand looking better, people becoming more comfortable, but supply has not quite caught up there yet. And that, that does give you risk for the temporary inflation that we're seeing, definitely. It does give you concern in terms of what future ex- inflation expectations will do. In other words, will people stop buying um, or will they you know, sort of stockpile money because they think everything will become more expensive? Uh, do people get nervous? Does consumer confidence decline because of inflation? So those are things to keep in mind. But one thing we are seeing is I, I, th- I do think that we're seeing Main Street beginning to catch up to where Wall Street was in the sense of there was a huge, like you said, there was a huge dichotomy last year. The, the stock market was up in a year where you had massive declines in GDP, massive uh, increases in unemployment. Now I think what we're seeing is how close can we get back to 100 percent? And if you think about it, right, we the economy plummets last year, even if you get 96, 97% of the way back, that's still a 3 to 4% recession. Right? I mean, if, if you, if I told you we were going to have a recession of 4%, I'd be scared. I'd be freaking recession. out. You'd be freaking out, right? It doesn't seem like that to us now because we had a recession of minus 30, minus 40% GDP quarters, and now we're coming back from that. But the question that we're looking at is, how, how far back do we get? Do we get 100% of the way back? And what are the repercussions if we don't, if we only get 97, 98% of the way back? What happens to people at that point? And so I think it's more a matter of just keeping focused, um, making sure that we, we keep our eye on the ball, we don't you know, put any monkey wrenches, that we don't add any monkey wrenches to the economy because there's already a lot of uncertainty out there. And that we, and I think to your point about Wall Street and Main Street, we got to make sure even as consumers that when we go back into the market and we're purchasing and buying again and going out and doing things that we remember to do it on Main Street, not on Wall Street. So don't, yeah, we've been purchasing a lot of Amazon and online retailing in the last year. Don't make that the new normal. We got to make sure that when we go back to our, our normal, that it's purchasing from local people because that's where the main street's going to catch up. Because if we just go and if we make our pandemic behaviors permanent and purchase everything online for in record record proportions, as we are seem to be doing again with Prime Day this week, then we're not going back to the previous economy. We're basically keeping that dichotomy between Wall Street and Main Street open, and that's not what we want because the long term growth is going to be Main, not on Wall Street. Well said. And to Alex's point, yesterday was Prime Day with Amazon. $5.6 billion in sales in 24 hours on Prime Day yesterday on Amazon. $5.6 billion. They're mind-boggling numbers. I mean, it's just absolutely startling, startling numbers. Um, Okay, the two toughest questions I'm going to ask you. Are you ready for these, Alex? Yes, go for it. Trey Murphy the third, turning pro NBA. Uh, Did he make the right decision? It, I mean, it, I'm seeing projections that he's won late first round, early second round. So I mean, for him, probably cashing in now because I mean, let's face it, the, the risk of injury is always there, right? I mean, he comes back to UBA, gets hurt, now all of a sudden his stock is down. So I, I think for him, seems like a good decision. As a UVA, UVA fan, I think I, I'm definitely going to miss him because I think he would have, I mean, his talent level from, especially from three, um, and I think his, his his zeal on defense, I think he was one of our better defensive players, at least it seemed to me. I think he'll be missed in terms of this coming year UVA. Well said, well said. Projected uh, late first round draft pick, 26 26 projected late first round. Reminds me a lot of DeAndre Hunter with the wingspan, the height, the ability to shoot from downtown. Kind of a 3 and D type player. Um, you think baseball wins tonight? Uh, I, I, I think so. I'm, I'm feeling it with this team. I, mean, I don't want to jinx them or anything. So I, I usually, I always prefer with my sports. I mean, you know I'm a generally optimistic person on a lot of things. With my sports, some people, my brothers would probably describe me as a pessimist. I prefer to be pleasantly surprised than devastatingly disappointed. But uh, I, I, I just feel like I think what we're seeing with UVA baseball is them really now playing up to the talent that we sort of 
felt they had before the season started. I just think I think they got off to a rough start to the season, and I think they played. One thing to keep in mind: UVA baseball played. I think, and this was I think I read this about a month ago when we were coming off our rough stretch. That UVA baseball played the the tenth or eleventh toughest uh, schedule in the country. So we were playing a lot of really good ACC teams at the beginning of our season. And I think that sort of masked the fact that this team has top 15 talent. It has excellent pitching, and it has offense that can cobble together. I mean, look at the other day, our 6 nothing win over Tennessee, small ball. A lot of steals, uh, you know, sacrifice bunts, singles in that. I mean, we had like six straight singles in that inning where we – Really blow it open, but to be shown, we can also win with the home run. We've hit some some big time homers. I mean, the Kyle's Grand Slam uh, really transformed that game. So I think the offense has shown they can win in numerous ways. The pitching has been really good. So I think we have as good a shot a shot as anyone. Alex, you are. I sincerely mean this, man. You are a a, a talented broadcaster, dude. We did this on the absolute fly because of some technical difficulties on the absolute fly. And this guy's talking college baseball, college basketball, and um, NBA draft projections, macro perspective on the markets, Bitcoin, China's influence on the Bitcoin markets, Amazon Prime, and more. I mean, the dude is such a baller, Alex Herpy. All right, tell us about today in Manana on Thursday, my friend. Oh, today manana is going to be so much fun on Thursday. I mean, we always have a blast, but this time I mean, we're a little extra spice with our blast because uh, we have two, three fantastic guests, actually. They're coming in. Tell, tell Judah to, to relax, though. They're coming in separate time slots. We won't, we won't sit three of them at the same time. He says, uh, uh, Alex, <laughs> he, says, he says, thank you, Jesus Cristo. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So first, first guest is going to be Ian Blomsky. He's the owner of Vite Spirits. He's going to come on the show. So that's going to be, they're, they're right there in the downtown mall. I've heard fantastic things about them. So Xavier and I are really excited to have him on. And then after him, we're going to be joined by Maria and Tara Di Massimo. They're the mother and daughter duo of the Glass Palette, another local business, uh, where basically you come in and they they help they teach you how to work with glass and create great artwork just as a as an individual you know coming in they do groups they do couples so two really fun local businesses that i think will be a blast for people to learn about well my friend i'm looking forward to it um thank you for being uh very good at adapting on the fly his name is alex erpy of emergent financial services he is the ceo his family trusted family for your uh your investment portfolio alex thank you my friend Thank you so much. Appreciate it. You have a good one. You too. All right. Uh, that's Alex Erpy, guys. Today, Imanana airs Thursdays at 10.15 a.m. Thursdays at 10.15 a.m. on the I Love Seville Network. I think that show is just absolutely finding its stride and is dynamite. Absolutely dynamite. Let's get to some comments here. Tracy Lee Shiflet, we love when you watch the show. She says, Amen, Jerry. Um, she says, orange and blue all the way, Jerry. Tracy Lee Shiffler, I love when you watch the program and when you offer perspective on the program. Uh, Marquise Johnson. Marquise Johnson. Uh, back in Charlottesville, he's visiting. Uh, he says, stick to the story. What does your run for government have to do with here and not downtown? Seems like the whites just want to drink their beer freely. Um, he says, it's about the whites, you said. Let's not forget y'all stole it from us. He says it creates more calls for police, drunken public, violence, etc. You ever think about the homeless dealing with their alcoholism problems? Send Sita McGill downtown. She's on the board of directors for Region 10. How did she not think about the impact of an open-air beer garden in the downtown mall? Um, and he says, y'all are just selling y'all souls to the devil. Uh, that's Marquise Johnson right there offering some commentary on my monologue to, to, to start the program. Uh, I'll respond to this, to Marquis Johnson here. Um, I appreciate when you share perspective on the program. All perspective is welcome on this show. Um, I have seen in Savannah, Georgia, Greenville, South Carolina, this concept managed appropriately, and it does not turn into a den of debauchery. 
I've seen this managed appropriately and it does not turn into a den of debauchery. I will take it a step further. The primary stakeholders in this outdoor beer garden concept are the restaurants and the restaurant owners, the ones that are managing debt service of tremendous proportions. Because they have so much skin in the game here, they're coming out of COVID, and what industry was ravaged more than the restaurants? You can make a strong argument for live music, but that's associated with the restaurants. You can make a strong argument with hospitality and weddings, but that's essentially in the same category as the restaurants as well. Um, with so much skin in the game, I would think the stakeholders, the restaurant owners, have every reason not to turn the open air beer garden into a den of debauchery. So please consider that, Mr. Johnson, uh, when making the comment of, of selling the soul to the devil. Um, I, I, I will respect, respectfully disagree with you on that one. Uh, now here's the next step we need to consider. This is gonna be an arms race between three municipalities. The town of Scottsville, Albemarle County, in the city of Charlottesville. The town of Scottsville, Albemarle County, and the city of Charlottesville are all competing for the same incremental tax dollars. First to market, which is looking like it's gonna be the downtown mall, is gonna have a huge advantage of capturing the low-hanging fruit. Tourists in the summer looking to come to a highly vaccinated place, Charlottesville, we're three in the state from a vaccination standpoint, Albemarle County's one. And the low-hanging fruit is going to be the first to market of opening this concept because the tourists will flock to this eight blocks like, like ants to honey. They're going to flock and spend their money in droves. So you will see an arms race. And this arms race is going to be Charlottesville government against Almoral County government against the town of Scottsville for a fixed amount of tourists and the money they spend in each area. I will bet you, because Albemarle and Charlottesville are synced and they go hand in hand, I will bet you that Albemarle County very quickly, very soon, will come up with a similar concept. The Shops of Stonefield is primed for this idea. And if you're able to do this concept in the Shops of Stonefield, you can then take an otherwise Big brand shopping center, that's what the shops of Stonefield are. It's, a, it's owned by a private equity firm out of New York City. And all they care about is jacking up the rents. You can take a big brand shopping center, a corporate brand shopping center in the shops of Stonefield and potentially localize it because you can justify the rents if you have foot traffic in the shops of Stonefield to justify said rents. Consider it. Um, one interesting wrinkle that came up out of yesterday's meeting, city council, was Cena McGill's con uh, comment. And remember, Cena McGill is the sister of Lauren Mendoza, who is a co-owner of Lampa. So Councilor Cena McGill's brother is the co-owner of a restaurant. So to say she has skin in the game here is an understatement. I would expect this concept to not just be on the mall. Cena McGill said in yesterday's meeting, this open air beer garden should not just be on the downtown mall, but should be in other places in the city of Charlottesville. Does that mean Ix Park? Does that mean Ix Park, Councillor McGill? Is that what you're alluding to there? That is a fair, fair question. Fair question. Someone should ask that question. Does that mean X Park? And I'll leave it at that. It's the uh, I Love Seville show on a Tuesday. My friends, we will see you tomorrow on the I Love Seville Network. Take care.